Okay, I'm going to take a few minutes here to answer this video. This was sent to me by uh, somebody, one of the followers of the ministry here. And it's by uh, Joe Major, Faith Baptist Church, uh, Pre-Trib Challenge number one. And they said, that, you know, sent me a link to this thing and we had a bunch of stuff to do, so I didn't get around to refuting it. But um, this guy has been brainwashed. And Joe Major, if you're watching this, you have been brainwashed by Stephen Anderson. You're not really looking at the scriptures here. But uh, I'll take your challenge. Let's watch. Hi, this is Pastor Major with Faith Baptist Church in Violet, Louisiana. And here over the next several weeks, I'm going to be coming to you with a series of videos called Pre-Trib Challenges. And so in these videos, I am directly challenging pre-tribbers to give us the one verse for these different questions and different doctrines concerning the pre-trib rapture. And so, you know, if you're pre-trib, you're welcome to comment on these videos, but don't come on there with this big, long dissertation or anything like that. Give us the one verse that explicitly says and states your belief. And so, okay, um, this is the problem here with a lot of these people and he, and he talks about this a little bit later but it's you know you just start out on the bad thing here um, <clears throat> second Timothy chapter 4 verse 3 for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables uh, he was converted by watching Stephen Anderson um, and now he's saying just one verse don't give us a big dissertation uh, um, that's what Bible believing Christianity is all about. Scripture with Scripture. That's what it's all about here. And, it, and of course, he'll come out later and he'll say, well, um, you know, it, it's not, I know, realize you need more than one verse, but you know, just give us the one verse and things. But let's continue here. So the question for this week is give us the one verse in the Bible that explicitly says, that the rapture comes before the tribulation. And so again, don't go on this big long rabbit trail or anything like that. If you post something like that, I'm just going to delete you off of there. Give us just the one verse. <laughs> just give us the one verse. That's not how it works when you're saved. All right, Bible believing Christians, you compare scripture with scripture. Look at the Pauline epistles, right? The totality of the Pauline epistles. Where is Paul ever telling anybody don't take the mark? Where is Paul getting any Christian ready to go into the time of Jacob's trouble? Falsely so called the Great Tribulation. See, but you gotta go through all those books and that takes time, you know? But let's continue. That backs up your belief about the pre trib that explicitly says it, not we know it's pre-trib because it's imminent and this and that. No, the one verse that backs it up. Now, pre-tribbers will inevitably say that, well, no scripture is confined to just one verse. And you're right, no scripture is confined to one verse. We are to compare scripture with scripture and search the scriptures to see whether these things are so. But if you can't give me one verse, that is the basic. Uh, okay, um, we know we know that you, you have to compare scripture with scripture. But if you can't give me one verse, uh, you're a hypocrite. You just contradicted yourself there. Double speak. You have to give me one verse that specifically says pre-trib rapture. And he'll go on to say, but I can show you one that says post-trib rapture. It goes to Matthew chapter 24, of course. And the word rapture is not in the Bible. So, you know. The proper term is being called up. The body of Christ is called up before the time of Jacob's trouble. And I can show you those you know, verses and things that prove that from the King James Bible. But we'll get back to that. Basis in the foundation of your belief, then you're not comparing scripture with scripture because you don't even have one verse to base your beliefs upon. And just to give you some examples of things that we ought to and be able to at least have one verse to base them upon. Well, how about salvation by grace through faith? We know that it is by salvation by grace through faith because the Bible explicitly tells us 
and Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith. And then we could go doctrine after doctrine after doctrine, and we could find verses, one verse, that explicitly states it, and that is our foundation verse. Okay, but you see, if you look at the verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, where the gospel is defined, he doesn't say grace through faith. So when it comes to salvation, you're not looking for just one verse. You're looking, you're comparing scripture with scripture with scripture. You see, again, you're not proving anything. Uh, if you want a little challenge there, show me any scripture that says just base your doctrine on one verse. This is not a Christian practice. Just one verse. Just one verse is all that you, you know. No, that's not how it works. Comparing scripture with scripture. So the, the whole first challenge thing here is, is, you know, and I guess all of his challenges are just one verse things. The whole thing is just ridiculous. I'm not going to go through all of them because the whole thing's just false. But let's continue. But for some reason, when it comes to the things about the pre-trib, pre-tribbers can't give one verse to back those things up. So I challenge you to give me the one verse stating where the, uh, the rapture is, where the Bible explicitly states it in the Word of God. Now, in each of these videos, I will also give you the one verse that we have that explicitly says that the rapture is after the tribulation. So Matthew chapter number 24 and verse number 29. I learned from Stevie Anderson, <laughs> you know, and he says, I'm going to give you the one verse that expressly states that the rapture comes after the tribulation. The word rapture is not in there. It's not there. You're a liar. Let's continue. The Bible says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And so right there in Matthew 24, talking about the coming of the Lord, what we call the rapture, it explicitly states that it is after the tribulation. Now pre trib uh, So you're going to change the scriptures now, just like Anderson does, your cult leader. It's immediately after the tribulation. It does not say that. If it's after the tribulation of those days. You're making the tribulation a title. You're lying. You're, subtract, you're subtracting from the scriptures. You see? And I'm going to get back to the proof thing here. It's showing where the, what the Bible actually teaches here. But uh, these people teach this thing. That this is somehow the rapture. And yet the word rapture is not even in there. And they'll mock you know, pre-trib or rapture believers. Because you don't have one verse saying that the rapture is before the tribulation. You don't have one verse that proves that it's the rapture is after the tribulation. Because the word rapture is not in the Bible. <laughs> okay? It's crazy. But you see, you say, well, what about this thing of the angels gathering together, the elect from the four winds of heaven to the other? You know, that's the rapture right there. Or whatever you want to call it, being caught up. Uh, no, it's not. Because there's no mention of dead saints coming up at that time. Okay? Reason number one. Secondly, if you want to go to, I think it's Luke. Uh, let's go here to Luke chapter, I forget if it's either 17 or 21. Um, okay. Um, it says here uh, about the two men in one bed. And by the way, that doesn't mean they're sodomites, okay? Uh, poor countries, uh, men usually sleep. There will be multiple peop people sleeping in one bed. Here in America, everybody gets their own bed. Then they think weird things because it says two men shall be in one bed. Even back in the past here in America. Just got to put that in there because I see that sometimes with people. Uh, poor countries, men sleep in the same bed. All right, doesn't mean anything is going on there. Uh, the one shall be taken, the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken and the other left. Two men shall be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. The angels gathering to get them together. 
But look at verse 37. And they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? They're taken. Where are they taken? And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. Hmm. A reference to Revelation chapter 19, the Battle of Armageddon. The Jews are taken out there, the elect. They are taken out. They're being chased by the Antichrist. They flee into the mountains. Okay, you got to compare scripture with scripture. I know that's difficult for people like Joe Major and Stephen Anderson, his cult leader. They're taken out there. There's no resurrection of the dead in Matthew chapter 24. None. You say, well, it's there, but it was revealed later. Uh, Jesus didn't reveal the resurrection of the dead. Oh, well, then you have another problem. Because he did. In the book of John. Let me show you. Uh, talking about Lazarus dying. Um, verse 24, Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus saith, said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Then in Christ shall rise first. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? We which are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. You see? So some of these posties will come out and they'll say, Well, Matthew chapter 24 and Mark 13, Luke 17, Luke 21, there's no mention of the resurrection of dead saints because it wasn't revealed yet. Um, it's revealed later. Paul reveals more detail in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 58. So that, that's where it's revealed. Jesus revealed it. Okay? John chapter 11, after John chapter 10, explaining to them about the catching up of the body of Christ. And they're going, huh? What? I don't get it. Yeah, because Jesus is explaining a different event in the book of John than he is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I know this stuff's way over the head of these posties. But I can't help it. But uh, there's no rapture there in Matthew chapter 24. What you're seeing is it's the second coming of Jesus Christ. And the angels that gather together the elect there, I believe, are redeemed saints. In the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God. All right. And you see a great multitude of angels. Actually, it's a number under 200 million, I think it is, in Revelation chapter 5. There before the first seal is opened. Hmm. Let's continue will say well that's not about the the rapture that's about revelation 19 and what they call uh jesus second advent but here's the thing you go on down in this same chapter and there are verses that are describing the event that we just read the coming of the lord and they go on down in this chapter and they use verses there about the rapture and they'll use them for the rapture uh no those who understand the, the issue no we don't use anything in matthew chapter 24 to describe the quote-unquote rapture um there is no such thing in matthew chapter 24 matthew chapter 24 is written completely to the jews for whom the time of jacob's trouble is for and i'd like to ask that to uh joe major here um what's the point of the body of christ going through this time kind of weird you need further purification I thought you're saved by grace through faith finished work of Jesus Christ why go into a time period where you need to be purified Catholic <laughs> excuse me but then they forget that these verses are talking about the event that we just read there and so take it in context and so they'll use verses 36 37 and it says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, know not the angels in heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noe were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noe entered into the ark. And so they'll use those verses to say, Well, that right there, that is about the rapture. But then you go back to verse number. Not a uh, serious Bible teacher that understands. Uh, the quote-unquote preacher rapture. No, they don't go to Matthew chapter 24. 
29, 30, 31, where it is talking about the rapture, and this here in its context is describing that event, they'll say, well, that one's not the rapture, but this one is. That makes absolutely no sense because the Bible here is talking about one event, and it's described. Yeah, I agree with you on that. It's talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. It has nothing to do with the quote-unquote rapture, the catching up of the body of Christ. Not anywhere in Matthew chapter 24. Describing the event that is talked about in verses 29 through 31. And of course, they'll use other verses here as well. In verse number 40, it says, Then shall be two in a field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not, what hour your Lord doth come. And so they'll use all these verses to say this is about the rapture, but then you go back to the event it's talking about in this same chapter, and they say it's not the rapture. Well, here's the thing. It calls it one thing throughout the chapter. The coming of the Lord. The coming of the Son of Man. And so that is our text. Verse number 29 through 31. After the tribulation, we have a clear verse. Nope. To change the scripture again, it doesn't say after the tribulation. It says after the tribulation of those days. Tribulation is not a title. Okay? Very important to get that. You're changing the scriptures. And I thought you said one verse, but then you quote, you read 3, 29 through 31. Verse that explicitly states our belief that it is after the tribulation. So I challenge you, pre-tribbers, give me one verse or a set of verses there you know it could be two or three verses in line in a chapter just like that there but give me the one reference that actually states that the rapture is before the tribulation thank you god bless okay um well, give me the one verse that states that the rapture is before the tribulation well you see it's a whole system of false terms all right I've used the term preacher of rapture in some of my studies and things because people, you know, don't know what you're talking about if you don't say that. I've used that, but that's not a biblical thing. It's not scriptural. It is the catching up, being caught up before the time of Jacob's trouble. The time of Jacob's trouble is in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. The Jews are very wicked right now. They've rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah. That's why the book of Revelation is going to be there to confirm the scriptures. That's why Moses and Elijah are coming back. The two witnesses. Again, what? why do we need the two witnesses? Those who are saved, those who are born again, eternally secure, what do we need Moses and Elijah show up for? Over there in the streets of Jerusalem. What's the point? Let me just show you here real quickly. Matthew chapter 24. I'll show you a couple other problems with this thing. Matthew chapter 24. First of all, we'll start out here. Uh, verse 13. He that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Is that true for today? You have to endure to the end to be saved? No. No, it's not true for today. But according to Joe Major and Anderson and all these other guys, um, this is all for Christians here. You have eternal security, but you have to endure to the end to be saved. That's a problem. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. We don't preach the gospel of the kingdom. Hmm. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Well, the followers of Stephen Anderson read and they don't understand. What is the holy place for a Christian? Do we have a holy temple someplace? Um, no, we don't. Our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. But you say, well, yeah, but we have the local churches. Okay, let's just go with that for a minute. How is the Antichrist going to stand in local churches? See, well, holographic, and okay, so they're all holy places? You mean to tell me every church building out there is a holy place? I don't think so. I don't think so. It's talking about the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. What significance is that for a Christian? There isn't any significance. We don't need to see a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. You say, well, come on, I don't believe it. Okay, how about verse 16? Let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. What are Christians doing in Judea? 
Um, let's get down a little bit further here. Verse 20, but pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Why are you worried about the Sabbath day as a Christian? Romans chapter 13, verse 9, Paul lists the commandments, and he doesn't even mention keeping the Sabbath day, remembering the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Doesn't even mention it. But here in Matthew chapter 24, it says, pray that your flight's not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Why? It's to the Jews. Okay? And I can say a whole lot more about the whole thing. But you want a, a scripture that talks about the body of Christ being caught up before the time of Jacob started, before the time of Jacob's trouble is started. Say it that way. Okay. Let me show you. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. I've been through this thing plenty of times. Right? Now, here you have, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. People falling away from doctrinal truth. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who exposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Okay, um, we're back to Matthew chapter 24 again there. Right? Um, he's sitting in the holy place, called here the temple of God. Claiming to be God. Hmm. You say, well, see, it's right there. It's written to Christians. It's written to Christians. See? Right there. Right there. It's written to Christians. Yeah, but you got to keep reading past verse 4, which posties don't like to do. Because, you see, you read the next couple of verses, it totally debunks their whole system. Verse 5. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Something is withholding the Antichrist, the man of sin, from showing up. He might be revealed in his time. What's it talking about? The Antichrist is the he. His time. What is the his time? The time of the church. The church age. All right? The time when the body of Christ is physically on the earth. In his church. You see? His time. This time belongs to Jesus Christ in a unique sense. You are in Christ today if you're saved. They weren't in Christ in the past. And they're not going to be in Christ in the time of Jacob's trouble. That's why you have to endure to the end to be saved. That's why you can't take the mark of the beast. If any man takes the mark, he goes to hell. Gets God's wrath. There's so many problems with this whole post-trip system. Look at verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let. Hindering. In other words, they're letting. Like in tennis, they hit the ball and it hits the net. So they say let. It's hindering. Who is the he who now letteth will let? That's the Holy Spirit. Until he be taken out of the way. Somebody has to be taken out of the way. Who would that be? You say the Holy Spirit. Well, then you say, well, what about the, the Holy Spirit being on the present? Well, that's very true. Well, then how could it be the Holy Spirit? Well, it's not. At least not totally the Holy Spirit. It's the body of Christ with the Holy Spirit indwelling in them. But the Holy Spirit's still going to be present on the earth, obviously, in the time of Jacob's trouble. See? He must be taken out of the way. Why? Because it's his time right now. The church age. I am... A member of the body of Christ. Saul on the road to Damascus. He's there and he gets knocked down and things. And the Lord says to him, what's he say? Saul, why persecutest thou me? Saul never persecuted Jesus Christ in the flesh. But he's persecuting his church. And Jesus says, you're persecuting me. It's Jesus' time right now on the earth. There's only one Christ on this earth. And that's Jesus Christ through his church but he has to be taken out of the way and then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders the dragon gives him his seat and power and great authority in Revelation chapter 13 you see how it works the body of Christ we are in his time right now. 
the body of Christ has to leave, taken out of the way. Why? Because we're hindering that Antichrist system. We fight against the Roman Catholic Church, which is the system of Antichrist. We're fighting against that. We need to be taken out of the way, and then they can get their little plans through. And that wicked shall be revealed. I mean, how many Christians would stand up against the Antichrist if he was revealed while the body of Christ is still here? Plenty. You say, well, then that, that's just ridiculous. I've never heard anything so ridiculous, okay? Revelation chapter 4, all right? Here, John goes up and he'll say, oh, you know, and I've gone over this whole thing about it. immediately I was in the spirit, and they say that it was, you know, kind of transcendental, you know, this out of body experience that John's, you know, he's just sitting there on the you know, island of Patmos, and, and people are walking by going, oh, he's in the spirit. He's, you know, his body's not up there, it's just his spirit. And you read the Pauline epistles and Paul talks about coming in, you know, and he's being in the spirit and things. Doesn't mean Paul was leaving his body, right? Again, I've done whole studies on that. But my point is, John is called bodily up to heaven. When it says in the spirit, it just means that he's seeing things in the future, right? Again, too much to, to deal with some of these people here. Like I said, I have a whole study on that. But he goes up and he sees four and twenty elders. Right there, and they're crowned. Hmm. Been through the judgment seat of Christ. Very interesting. Revelation chapter five. And he brings this up in another one of the things. I watched the other ones, and like I said, I'm not gonna go through it all. Uh four and twenty uh, the four and twenty elders here again, before you see them there, fell down before the Lamb. Alright. And um and they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, and tongue, and people, and nation. These are not Old Testament Jews, in other words. Um, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, uh, those are Christians. Hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Reigning on the earth is promised to a Christian in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. All right? If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. Right, and you say, but then there's only John and 24 hours. That's only 25. Okay, well, let's just assume that for a minute. Uh, how did they get up there? There's no other Christians up there. It's just 25 of them. How'd they get up there? Kind of weird, but there are saved Christians up there. Verse 11, and I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels. Again, in the resurrection, they're neither, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven studies on that too. Uh, many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. All right. Um, numbers given there. Not that many Christians that are now up there as resurrected angels. And of course you hit Revelation chapter 6 and uh, there you have I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I, I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. All right? So you have John, 24 elders, and then this number of angels that's up there. They're there before the Antichrist is unleashed in Revelation chapter 2. Lines up perfectly with 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The Antichrist can't even show up until the body of Christ is gone. But you say, well, I, well, I, well you know, I'll give you another one. Okay? One more, free of charge. All right. Verse 3. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth. And that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. Um, take peace from the earth? You say, what's the significance? Romans chapter 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the, to the flesh. Um... I'm going to skip down here to verse 7. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace 
from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Sorry, Paul, not so. You see, because in Revelation chapter 6, the second rider, the red horse rider, takes peace from the earth. So why would you give a promise of peace from God when it's God that removes peace by opening the second seal? Kind of a problem, isn't it? Revelation chapter 16. Uh, okay, verse 20. The God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Now, we could go through all the Pauline epistles, but they all begin and end with promises of peace coming from the Lord. And yet, the Lord takes peace from the earth. And Revelation chapter 6. How do you work that out? Very simple. The body of Christ isn't here. Otherwise, God would be a liar. God would be a hypocrite. Ephesians chapter 1. I'll give you another one. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. Let's go there real quickly. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. All right, a whole lot more I could say on that. Eternal security. Revelation chapter 14. And the third angel followed them, verse 9, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Notice the key word there is any man. You say, well, no Christian would take the mark, you see. No Christian would take the mark. Um, well, then that puts you in another contradiction because in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. You're commanded to provide for your house as a man, saved man. And yet in the time of Jacob's trouble, the only way to do it is to take the mark. But if you take the mark, you get God's wrath, and you go into to hell and you burn forever. But Ephesians chapter 1 says you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You see the mess you get into? Um, there's all kinds of scriptures. Lots and lots and lots of scriptures that prove that the body of Christ cannot possibly go into the time of Jacob's trouble. And like I said, what would be the point of it? What would be the point of going into the time of Jacob's trouble? We don't need to be purified as Christians. Jesus paid it all on the cross. Why do I have to go into some time where I see his wrath hitting this earth? And show me one verse of scripture in the Bible where God poured out wrath on just people. People that are doing things and living righteously. It's kind of weird. God judges wicked people. God would have spared Sodom and Gomorrah if Abraham could have found ten just men. There's a lot more than ten just people on this earth. And yet, the body of Christ is going to go into the time of Jacob's trouble. It makes no sense at all. None. Uh, so, Joe Major, uh, you got major problems here. I like that little play on words there. Um, get away from Stephen Anderson. He's a heretic. And you're a heretic for following him. That's going to be it. Thank you for watching.